series, um, a delightful series of lectures that we have by invited speakers. And tonight, we have something really special in store. As Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor speaks to us, um, students, staff, faculty, visiting members of the community. Um, and she'll be speaking with the faculty as well on Friday. So many of us have the delight of hearing from her twice over her time here. We're really looking forward to it, so welcome. Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor has been a professor of English at Liberty University for over two decades, where she has, is now serving in her last semester before moving on to her new position as research professor of English and Christianity and Culture at Southeastern Seminary. Her writing appears in Christianity Today, First Things, The Gospel Coalition, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and Books and Culture, among other places. She is the author of several books, including most recently, On Reading Well, Finding the Good Life Through Great Literature. It is in the field of literary studies that Dr. Pryor has placed her academic focus, especially in that of the 18th century, a period she loves, and I quote her words on this, for its emphasis on philosophy, ethics, aesthetics, and community, as well as its efforts at correcting the universal human impulse to gravitate toward extremes. We will hear more about this century with all of its beauty and brokenness, I'm sure, as she speaks to us tonight about the content of her research and another book, Fierce Convictions, The Extraordinary Life of Hannah Moore. With anticipation, let's give Dr. Pryor a warm welcome. Picture the scene at a dinner party in London, England in 1789. The men are wearing powdered wigs, velvet coats, ruffled shirts, silk breeches, and silver buckled shoes. The women don fine silk dresses. The hoops around their hips are several feet wide. Their hair is piled just as high, ornamented with ribbons, feathers, and flowers. Somewhere between the serving of the fruit tarts and the after-dinner wine, one of the women spreads a pamphlet open on the table. She turns to a gentleman seated next to her and asks him, have you ever seen the inside of a slave ship? The woman is Hannah Moore. The picture she points to is a drawing of the cargo hold of the infamous sea vessel, the Brooks. The ship was legally allowed to carry up to 454 slaves, each tucked into an unimaginably tiny space of about six foot by one foot. Yet the ship was known to have sometimes packed in more than 600 slaves, 600 human souls, like dried tobacco leaves stuffed into a bowl of a wooden pipe. The illustration of the ship had been produced through stealth, stealth efforts by the abolitionists. It was one of the most powerful weapons in their campaign to end the slave trade and is said to have brought viewers to tears. Hannah Moore carried a copy of the print around with her in her order to show it to people every chance she could. She, could. she understood that the way to societal reform was through the imagination, the moral imagination. The poet Percy, Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote a number of decades later in a defense of poetry, 1821, more than a, a decade before the abolition of slavery in Great Britain, this. The great secret of morals is love, or a going out of our nature. A man, to be greatly good, must imagine intensely and comprehensively, 
He must put himself in the place of another and of many others. The pains and pleasures of his species must become his own. The great instrument of moral good is the imagination. Now, while most of us today, especially for English majors, have heard of Percy Bysshe Shelley, Hannah More has largely been forgotten. Even so, her moral imagination, this thing that Shelley was talking about, helped to change the world. Now, the phrase moral imagination was actually coined earlier by Edmund Burke, who's considered today the father of modern conservatism in his 1790 pamphlet, Reflections on the Revolution in France. Later, much, much later and more recently, in an article in First Things from 2009, titled Defining Moral Imagination, we get a more extended definition of what the moral imagination is. This article describes it as a uniquely human ability to conceive of fellow humanity as moral beings and as persons, not as objects whose value rests in utility or usefulness. It is a process by which a self creates metaphor from images recorded by the senses and stored in memory, which are then occupied to find and suppose moral correspondences in experience. Bear with me, it's a long definition, but it's worthwhile. It's an intuitive ability to perceive ethical truths and abiding law in the midst of chaotic experience. The moral imagination should be an aspiration to a proper ordering of the soul and consequently of the commonwealth. In this conception, to be a citizen is not to be an autonomous individual. It is a status given by a born existence into a world of relations to others. To be fully human is to embrace the duties and obligations toward a purpose of security and endurance for first and foremost, the family and the local community. In other words, the moral imagination forms us as individuals for each other for our families and our community. This kind of definition, written in the 20th century, was instinctive to Hannah More, who never articulated nor needed to articulate what for her seemed simply to be a biblical approach to the wrongs she faced in her society across the British Empire, and then, of course, across most of the world. But let me tell you a little bit more about Hannah. She was born in 1745 outside the seaside city of Bristol in the charity schoolhouse where her father, Jacob Moore, served as schoolmaster. From early on, Hannah, who was the fourth of five daughters, all of them quite precocious, Hannah of all of them exhibited the most natural intelligence, sharp wit, and a way with words. Her father instructed her at home, as was common then, and she exceeded the typical education provided to girls at that time um, of any class, not just the working class. So although she was born to humble parents who were of the laboring class, because a man who was a, a charity school teacher was not considered high class, he was just barely above a laborer, she ended up rising to social and economic prominence in an age in which, for the most part, your birth determined your class for your entire life and therefore your entire destiny. She was schooled in classical languages because her father knew them, so she learned a number of languages, Latin, Greek, French, um, and she was able to hone her skills in language because Bristol saw many people of different languages coming in and moving in and out of this thriving city. And because she lived in this place of opportunity, this young girl who otherwise very likely would have lived and died in obscurity, achieved some local fame while she was yet a teenager. Her sisters moved into the city and opened up a school to serve the daughters of the burgeoning um, middle class there. And eventually Hannah joined them first as a student and then she became a teacher herself and there, she met a gentleman who was a relative of one of the students there who was a wealthy landowner. And again, she would 
ordinarily a girl like this would not move in those circles. Um, and after visiting him at his beautiful estate a few times, um, she and he became engaged to marry. But um, it was not to be because this wealthy landowner who was very smitten with Hannah also had a terrible case of cold feet. And he left her at the altar not once, not twice, but three times, yes. It was very heartbreaking for her, for Hannah. Um, but as was customary for the times, uh, her family arranged for him to settle an annuity on her so that she would get like basically a, a yearly income for her trouble and her time. And because having a broken engagement like that was considered, you know, it just was a, a mark on a young woman. And so this was a way of compensating her. Um, and this settlement was actually generous enough for Hannah to be able to live independently. So she quit her job as a teacher at the school and decided to pursue her dream of being a writer by going to London. Um, so again, here was a girl who was born in very humble circumstances, became financially independent, um, and was able to pursue this dream of writing, which was pretty much unheard of in, in that day there were women writers, but there weren't very many who were born poor. Um, so she traveled to London, and because she had already been writing poetry and plays for the school, um, some of her works were sent ahead of her. And as soon as she arrived, um, she, already, she was quickly introduced into the most fashionable literary circles in London. Um, she met Samuel Johnson, the famous critic, who walked into his own sitting room where she was waiting for him and quoted some lines from her poems to her. Um, can you imagine being a young female writer and having this hero of yours come and, and quote your work um, to you? That's what happened to her. Uh, so she got into that circle. She intro was introduced to the actor David Garrick, who also produced plays at the theater. I hear you guys have a great theater here. Um, and I'm competing with Mary Poppins tonight. Um, and she, she just became basically the toast of the town. Um, again, it's hard to imagine because we haven't even, most of us haven't even heard of her. She actually is uh, featured in a painting um, from the time called The Nine Living Muses, which was a painting of the nine most esteemed artistic and literary women of the time, and she was one of them. So being present, being uh, among the powerful of her day um, increased her platform and her influence, to use the kind of 21st century words we use. And she found it very intoxicating. Um, her letters home are just simply delightful to read. She and her sister uh, wrote back and forth to each other and to her other sisters. Uh, and so we have quite a record of her time there. Um, yet, she never really felt at home there among the fashionable. And then one year, um, a friend of hers gave her a book that was written anonymously. And it was a devotional book. It was a, consisted of letters written um, from this anonymous writer um, to various people about his Christian faith. Um, and it turned out that the book was written by John Newton a name that is probably familiar to you, most famous for writing the wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, which he wrote as a result of his own experiences being master or captain of a slave ship. So Moore, um, Moore read this book by Newton at this, at this time in England and in Moore's life, the evangelical movement was growing in England and having an influence. Um, I know that that's evangelical is, um, seems like in the past couple of years has become a dirty word for many people. Um, I am one, so um, I own it. Um, I'm proud of it. Um, and a lot of us don't realize, we think that it was something invented in 2016 or something, but it actually goes all the way back to early 18th century England where Hannah More um, lived and this movement was growing and burgeoning at the time, and one of the reasons it was growing is because um, there was growing uh, opposition to the slave trade, and the evangelicals were foremost among them. So, this, uh, so 
so more at this time she was she was in London she was the toast of the town she was very popular everyone loved her but she was disillusioned by all the frivolity of high society and so she met William Wilberforce in 1787 the same year that she journeyed to John Newton's church to hear him preach and both of them encouraged her to join them. She, actually, she was already involved in the abolitionist circles, but she became a member of the evangelical um, circle called the Clapham Sect, based in London, where Wilberforce and Newton uh, were working together. And Hannah was tempted to leave fashionable society, but both Wilberforce and Newton encouraged her to remain in the world, if not of it, in order to exert that influence that she'd gained for good, and in particular, toward the abolition of the slave trade. Uh, it's interesting because this is the same advice that Newton gave Wilberforce upon his conversion to Christianity, who he, Wilberforce thought that when he uh, became a Christian, um, he should leave his post as member of parliament and go into what we call today full-time ministry. Um, and Newton, uh, encouraged him that he could do ministry right there in Parliament where they needed him. Uh, if you've ever seen, as a side note, if you've ever, if you've not seen it, you should see the film Amazing Grace, which is about William Wilberforce, and it features, it has John Newton in it, and it has a couple of cameo appearances uh, of Hannah Moore. And she's the one who's, this is, a, you know, it, it's pretty historical, not exactly precise, but there's a lovely dinner uh, table scene where Wilberforce is thinking about leaving Parliament and, and the writers of the script have Hannah Moore uh, be the character who tells Wilberforce um, that he can basically serve the Lord and the people by staying in, in Parliament. She says, we, I humbly uh, suggest you can do both, serve the Lord and Parliament. It's important to remember that this was a very different world. This was a time when the very idea of social progress barely existed. People believed, because it was true at the time, that being born rich or poor or a slave was ordained by God and there was nothing one could or should do to change it. People believed then, as they had for all of human history before it, that to challenge these things was to challenge the will of God. But the evangelicals, evangelical movement's emphasis on the importance of each individual soul actually helped people begin to imagine things that few had imagined before. Hannah Moore and her fellow evangelicals began to imagine and envision a society of greater humanity, greater humaneness, greater flourishing, and greater faith. And they wanted these things for everyone. Rich, poor, man, woman, free, and slave. Of course, this was also a time when being born a woman meant facing many obstacles, um, just like it does sometimes today. Um, at this time, women could not vote, they could not hold public office, they could not get a university degree, uh, and they could not even be members of most abolitionist societies. Man Hannah Moore was never officially a member. But these barriers did not stop her. She employed the power of her moral imagination not in the inner circles of power, but outside of them. Not as a man with a classical education with land and a vote, but as a woman born in poverty and denied by law a university education and political office. And not with the strength of the sword, but with the pen in her published books, her pamphlets, poems, plays, and in, as I've already mentioned, many private letters. Her first efforts at reform, even before she um, was centrally involved in the abolitionist movement, were directed toward the upper class. She'd already won them over with her classically written poems and plays, and she believed that the upper class bore the most responsibility to bring about social change. <clears throat> 
She challenged the morality and religion of the fashionable by writing treatises that exhorted them to exchange their nominal, empty, secularized version of Christianity for genuine faith. Even the queen read Moore's works and confessed to being convicted by her words. Uh, I think she told, she said that she was going to have her maid stop um, curling her hair on Sundays or something. That was, that was a lot. <laughs> Moore challenged also the traditional approaches to female education. And she urged more substantive, scholarly, and Christian education for young women than was then fashionable. But during all of this uh, writing that she did, for, especially for the upper classes, the matter of slavery was becoming more and more pressing on her. In 1790, she wrote to her sister that she had obtained a copy of one testimony that was to appear before a committee of the House of Commons. So this is in her letter. She's relaying the testimony of this witness, and this is what she tells us. The witness was taken to a small gathering of slave traders about to put a, uh, an African infant to death. I asked them why they murdered it. They answered, because it was of no value. I told them in that case, I hoped they would make me a present of it. They answered that if I had any use for the child, then it was worth money. I first offered them some knives, but that would not do. They, however, sold the child to me for a mug of brandy. It proved to be the child of a woman whom the captain of our ship had purchased that very morning. We carried it on board and judge of the mother's joy when she saw her own child put on board the same ship, her child whom she concluded was murdered. She fell on my knees and kissed my feet. I remember Moore is relaying this testimony to her sister and then she adds in the letter to her sister, these are her words, in what light does this anecdote place this detestable trade? Her letters are filled with these kinds of testimonies urging those who agreed with her and those who disagreed with her about slavery, about its abomination. With the most horrific parts of the slave trade occurring far from the British Isles, most British citizens had little idea what it actually entailed. It was easy for them to imagine modern slavery as something like that which existed in ancient Greek and Roman culture a lifelong humane servitude into which one was born, not violently stolen into, or even the kind of slavery or bond servanthood that the Bible talks about. In fact, some people use biblical passages to justify slavery, not understanding that the role of a bond servant described in the Bible, again, is nothing like the violent, forcible bondage of the modern slave trade. So in addition to carrying about copies of these anti-slavery pamphlets to show at every opportunity, I mean, Hannah was really fun at the parties pulling out this, the slave pamphlets, right? She also sold prints of an oil painting of an African boy that her friend had, uh, had painted. She acted as a liaison between the abolitionist Thomas Clarkson um, and the London associates, keeping everyone informed of Clarkson's research in Bristol slave ship ports. She kept a copy, as I've already mentioned, of that uh, famous drawing of the slave ship. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a piece of, of abolitionist material that is considered to be the most effective among the um, abolitionist tools. She also led a boycott of West Indian sugar, which was really no small thing in a tea-drinking nation. Um, those who supported the boycott were ridiculed as anti-Saccharites and criticized as hypocrites and mocked for their sanctimonious asceticism. But uh, Moore is considered by scholars to be, to have led up, led the most successful of all of these boycotts. She also urged the production of a dramatic adaptation of Afra Ben's fictional account titled Orinoco, or The Royal Slave, uh, which is a sympathetic portrayal of the slave of the title as someone who is heroic and noble. And in explaining why she thought this play should be put on the stage, she said, so many go to a play who will never go to church. <laughs> 
She made her own contribution to the literature of the abolitionist movement when she produced the poem Slavery in 1788. Now this was a strategy that um, the evangelicals used. Uh, William Wilberforce was scheduled to present a piece of ab uh, abolitionist uh, legislation before Parliament. Uh, so he was trying to change the laws, but they also knew that in order to change the laws, the hearts of the people had to be changed. So Hannah Moore had two weeks to write this poem so that it would be published and released the same day that Wilberforce was to present. Um, and so she has all these notes in her letters about the writing of this poem and how furiously she worked on it. And it was released on time and it's called uh, Slavery. And it is actually one of her most anthology uh, anthologized works today. Uh, if you pick up a, a volume, uh, an anthology of women's literature or romantic literature, this is most likely uh, the work that will, will be in it. Um, and it's a brilliant work because she appeals to everything. She begins with a theological examination of the notion of liberty, uh, and then she moves to appeal to the British citizens' notions of liberty and virtue, but ultimately the power of the poem is in the way she portrays the kidnapped slave being taken away um, from his home and and subjected to the most brutal kind of servitude. Uh, it, it's an impassioned plea for the, for the humanity of these fellow beings. Um, but with that said, uh, I've talked about Hannah Moore's slavery poem, the treatises that she wrote uh, to uh, the wealthy that were very influential and best-selling. It's important to note, because some of you might be wondering why you haven't heard of her, is that by the standards of readers today, um, a lot of her works come perilously close to being unreadable to most people. Um, they can be dry and didactic, yet they were extremely popular and influential among her contemporaries. And that's a point I wanna make, especially for those of you who might be thinking about becoming writers, uh, in, whether literary writers or writers in your field, um, sometimes writing for one's time means that you're going to produce work that may not pass the test of time. It may not have the universal appeal to later generations. In some sense, more, more success was in so influencing her time that the times changed. And that's partly why her works seem um, harder to read um, today because they are very um, didactic and very um, classical in their style. But she wrote some other works, and these are, these are actually considered by most literary scholars to be her most successful. Because at the same time that she and Wilberforce and Newton and their friends were working to abolish slavery, that wasn't all they were doing. Uh, one day Wilberforce came to visit her at her um, country home outside of Bristol. Uh, and she encouraged him to go and visit the famous Cliffs of Cheddar nearby. And when he came back, he was so forlorn. He went into his room, wouldn't eat supper, and they tried to figure out what was wrong with him. Uh, and he was so upset because of the condition that he found the poor of Cheddar in, particularly the children. Poverty was extremely bad in those times, and the laboring poor were not much better off than people imagined the slaves to be. And that's why it was sometimes hard for people to see slavery for the evil and wickedness that it was, was because it was a brutal time and a lot of people um, were living in brutal conditions. And so more in, with Wilberforce and Newton's blessing and their financial support, um, she embarked on another project and that was to open Sunday schools across the region um, in Somerset County where she lived. Um, and of course, this was a Sunday schools at this time, as you may know, were not the Sunday schools we have today with flannel graphs and Bible stories. It was literally school on Sunday held for the poor because Sunday was the only day that the poor didn't work, including very small children, because very small children worked six long hours a day or six days a week and long hours. And so these were schools to teach arithmetic and reading and Bible lessons to the children. And lo and behold, once more opened the Sunday schools, um, she realized that there wasn't, and she taught 
she taught the children and eventually parents too because she added some adult, adult instruction. Um, she realized that there wasn't much adequate material for them to read. So she started a new project called the Cheap Repository Tracks, and, and Cheap didn't have the negative connotations that it has um, today, and began to write very cheap pamphlet literature, tracks as, as they're called, with entertaining but edifying stories, poems, ballads, lessons, and so forth. And more was brilliant because these cheap tracks, this pamphlet literature was very, very popular at the time, and there was a lot of it, but they usually contained um, uh, uh, off-color kinds of stories, stories about sinful people and, and, and wickedness and lewdness or superstitions or witches. It was, you know, it was cheap base entertainment. So Moore wanted to impart moral lessons. So she copied the style and the titles. Actually, she improved the art. She hired a special artist to create art for the, for the covers of these pamphlets. And she gave them these enticing titles, like Sinful Sally, The Gin Shop, The Roguish Miller. Like she really did this. And then she draws them in with these stories and then they always have like a moral lesson or a Bible lesson. Again, literary scholars consider this to be uh, her most successful and innovative work uh, because she actually elevated the art of the tract or the pamphlet. Um, and, and people really bought into them. The, the sponsors would buy bundles of them and have them distributed to the poor. Um, people offered trade-ins, you know, trade in one of the real, the scandalous ones and we'll give you one of the edifying ones. Uh, <laughs> just like, the, what, do they have gun, tra gun, gun trades or drug? I don't even know, but we do these things today. Um, there were, so she did, there were, there were um, let me make sure I've got the number. She did this for a number of years. Um, and I think there are two million tracks eventually in, um, in circulation. Uh, she wrote about half of them. She supervised all of them. Um, and of course, like everything else that she did, it garnered a lot of controversy. Uh, first of all, I mean, the Sunday schools were controversial because even teaching the poor to read was seen as, as revolutionary and, and something that might incite a revolution like the one that was happening across the... the um, uh, the way in France, um, and uh, and and then so on the one side there were people who thought that Moore was being too uh, too liberal, too too revolutionary, and then there were the people who thought that you shouldn't mix a morality and religious instruction with entertainment, like that that, that was dangerous. So she got it from uh, from both sides. But I do want to, I, I just, I can't talk about these tracks without giving a little excerpt to, sh to show you what I'm talking about um, of the kinds of um, hints that she would give, the lessons that she would give. And, and uh, there, there were, I mean, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit, the, some other um, lessons. But she also was empowering the poor in an age that didn't believe in doing that because she was helping them to be more frugal and to get by with what they had, which some people would see as oppressive, but for her, in, in today's terms, but in her time, nobody even cared about the poor, let alone tried to help them improve their lives. So there's a, there's a pamphlet called The Cottage Cook, and it ends with a list of what she calls friendly hints. And here's a, here, here are the friendly hints. The difference between eating bread new and stale is one loaf in five. If you turn your meat into broth, it will go much farther than if you roast or bake it. A bit of leek or an onion makes all dishes savor at small expense. If the money spent on tea were spent on home-brewed beer, the wife would be better fed, the husband better pleased, and both would be healthier. Keep a little scotch barley, rice, dry peas, and oatmeal in the house. They are all cheap and don't spoil. Keep also pepper and ginger. Last one from the same list. Pay your debts, serve God, love your neighbor. Isn't that nice? But there was another class of readers besides the wealthy and the poor that Moore had not yet reached. Um, 
and this is the swelling ranks of the middle class. Now, this is the time when the middle class was beginning to grow because for a long time in human history, um, and really right up until this point in British history, there were just, you know, you were either nobility and high class or you were low. But at this time, um, there was a middle class growing. And by the way, pop quiz, anyone know what the source of wealth newly emerging wealth for this middle class or where that might have come from? Slavery, yeah. So here's this middle class growing. And what they like to read was not, you know, classical plays and poetry and not cheap tracks, but they like to read novels. Um, there was the circulating libraries were increasing and, and people were reading these sort of scandalous uh, stories of, of love and um, amorous intrigue. And so Moore, again, as was her model, um, decided to write her own novel patterned on these popular entertaining books. Um, and yet she included in it um, lessons on education and, and religion, um, but it was all packaged in a story about a young man looking for a suitable wife. It was called Caleb in Search of a Wife. Um, and this is actually, uh, this novel was, was um, by some standards, England's first best-selling novel. Um, it was that popular. And uh, Moore, again, used it to promote not only um, her ideas about, about education, especially for women, um, but also a newly emerging idea um, promoted by evangelicals called the companionate marriage, which is the kind of marriage that we understand today, which is based on friendship and love, not just political or financial gain. It's a radical revolutionary idea, or it was then. It hasn't always been around. Um, and so this, no this novel, again, this, this is, um, was probably the most popular of her works. It was the only novel that she wrote. Um, but it, it, I mean, people just went crazy about it. it it, it sold out it, all over the country. Everyone was, going, was asking for it. It's been translated into languages. It's one of the first, it is actually um, the first, uh, one of the, not one of the first, but it was, um, it was an early novel published in America. I have an actually a, a 17, uh, I have a, an early 18th century edition of it published here in America. Um, so it was all of these things, Moore's attempt to reform the upper class, to reform the poor, um, to reform the middle class. These are the things that, that earned her the title that one historian has given her as the first Victorian. Um, because it was the Victorian age, as it has a bad rap and there, there's some negative connotations we have with Victorianism, but the Victorian age was an age of astonishing reform. This was, if you've read any Charles Dickens, you know this was the age when people actually began to develop a conscience about orphans and the poor and chimney sweeper, sweepers. Um, and this was just not something that had existed before. It was actually the 18th century evangelicals like Hannah Moore who began to help people to think with a moral imagination about changing the world and decreasing suffering for everyone. And another uh, point that about uh, their program and, and about evangelicals that a lot of people have forgotten today is that they actually include, included, their empathy, included in their empathy, not just human beings, but animals as well. Um, so Moore and Wilberforce and Newton and the other evangelicals were influential in developing many of the first programs for animal welfare. Many don't know that at the very same time that Wilberforce was fighting first and foremost to abolish slavery. He was also one of the founding members of the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, uh, which eventually became the RSPCA in England, the ASPCA here. Um, and Moore participated in this effort. Um, she wrote against animal cruelty in, uh, in her tracts for the poor and in her treatises for um, the rich. Uh, because people were cruel to animals as well. 
Uh, it wasn't until almost a century later, about 75 years later, actually, that Anna Sewell wrote Black Beauty, um, which is, is it's considered one of the first works to, to really help people to start thinking about the suffering of animals. So nearly a century before that book, Hannah Moore was including um, notions of, of animal welfare um, and humane treatment of animals in her works. So that's a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> I'm going to wrap up here, and I can't wait to take your que questions because I haven't even covered the, uh, scratched the surface here. Moore's last works in her life, she, li she, lived to be, uh, she, she lived to be 88 years old, which is pretty old for that time. So she had a long uh, career of, of writing and reforming. During her last years, her works were overtly biblical and spiritual. And the last one that she published uh, was when she was 80 years old. When she was too old to traipse about the English countryside or the London streets as she once had, the people came to her. She lived her last years as a patron saint for British and American evangelicals, countless numbers of whom made pilgrimages to her rural estate outside of Bristol, hoping to learn at the feet of the woman who had opened Sunday schools for the poor, taken on atheists and revolutionaries in the French Revolution, she wrote a tract about that too, written a best-selling novel, and helped to abolish English, England's slave trade. Hannah Moore was one of England's best-selling writers. She produced volumes of books over the course of her life covering the span of 1745 to 1833. What was most remarkable about her literary output is that she wrote for audiences ranging from the highest of the high, including royalty, to the lowest of the low, the poor laborers, and everyone in between. Few, if any, writers had done this before. Few do it today. But few, if any, had both the fierce convictions and the moral imagination of Hannah More. Now, her reputation, like her literary fame, was but a vapor. Yet the souls of the Africans her, help, her efforts helped to free, and the poor whose lives were improved in her schools, and the elite who were moved by her example and her presence are eternal. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, it's now the third time I think I've heard you speak on Hannah Moore, and every every time it's just as moving. And uh, <laughs> what did you think I was going to say? Um, so I've got a couple of the guys in the back with microphones, and so if you have questions, just raise your hand, and one of them, whoever's in proximity to you, will come and deliver you a microphone to ask that question. If it's okay. I'm going to start. Yeah. All right. Uh, so while you're forming a question in your mind, I'm going to ask one myself. So this one's a bit biographical pertaining to you. Uh, so I, I, I'm very interested in the idea of a usable past. And uh, so how in your own life, and now I know something of your story, um, so pro-life activism, your own involvement with animal welfare and other things, how did she maybe shape or steer you in some of your own thinking about you know, social involvement? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I discovered Hannah Moore. Um, oh, I can't do the math. I'm not a math person. It's, it's 25 to 30 years ago, I guess, is when I discovered her. And I, you know, I was I was forming obviously at that time as a person and as a Christian. Um, and when I discovered her, I found what I felt was a kindred spirit. But then as I studied her, uh, yes, she, she definitely was a kindred spirit. But I was able to to see um, a model, really, for, for living a life that bridges many divides. Um, she, she lived in such an unusual time because it was so divided and stratified, and she, just by being a person of integrity and, um, and trying to apply her beliefs to every area, like, she was just controversial. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, it's remark. I mean, I, I saw that then, but I guess all these years later, I see it even more now, and I just don't know that 
that I would um, be able to do what I do if I didn't have an example in her. Yeah. Dr. Black. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Pryor, for being with us. Appreciate it. Um, I'd like to know if um, she had any relationship or if there was talk about her among other women writers who are emerging at this time. Um, we have, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft. You know, she was probably in her 40s when Mary was writing. Maybe they'd be about the same age. Mary Shelley, who would be a generation younger than her. Jane Austen, who would be maybe a little bit younger than she was. I just wanted to know yeah. what oh, other women great. writers did. Great question. I feel like I should have planted this, but I didn't. Um, so three, three answers. So, so more, she, uh, she was a member of what was called the Blue Stocking Circle. Uh, she was a second generation member. And the Blue Stocking Circle was a circle of, of, of ladies in London who were learned and witty and scholarly. Um, and they actually, men were sometimes members. There, there wasn't the, the sharp divide between the sexes in the, in the 18th century that we see later in the Victorian age or today uh, in evangelicalism. Um, so she was, she, was, uh, she was a member of this literary circle uh, and she wrote poetry uh, for them. She wrote a, a Bob Blue was a, was a poem she wrote with that title as sort of dedication to them. And then, then she's, but then she became evangelical and she kind of left that life. Um, so there is actually, um, so about Mary Wollstonecraft, she refused to read A Vindication of the Rights of Women. Um, she said, this is, this is painful, um, because even all of our, our heroes have um, flaws. Uh, she, she thought that the notion of rights for women was as ridiculous as children's rights, having rights for children. She said, oh, next thing, they'll be talking about children's rights. So, you know, Moore was, cons she was very conservative uh, in, in, in almost every way, by almost every definition, and that's what makes it so remarkable that she was doing these things that people thought was revolutionary and progressive. Um, in ter Austin, uh, what we have on the record about Jane Austen is that Jane, when Caleb, her no when Hannah Moore's novel came out, Jane Austen wrote to her sister, Cassandra, I think Cassandra wrote and asked Jane if she had read it yet. And so Jane wrote back and said she hadn't read it and how she detests the evangelicals. Um, but then she said she'll probably read it someday and like it, love it like everyone else, or some, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, so that's the, the record that we have um, between those two. I don't know of anything where more mentions. Of course, Austin, no one knew who Austin was, right? So Aust, nobody knew who Austin was. Nobody was, you know, her works were not uh, popular in her own time. Hannah Moore was huge best-selling author. Everybody knew who she was. And yet now today, we know which works passed the test of time and which ones didn't. So, yeah. Great question. President Sweeting. Dr. Pryor, um, if someone wants to read more about her life, are there, are there good biographies? Um, where would somebody start? Well, um, <laughs> I did write a biography, um, and it's called Fierce Convictions, which is where the title of this talk uh, comes from. Um, so that is the most recent biography. There is a two, 1999 or 2000 biography by a historian, Ann Stott, um, whom I consider to be the world's foremost living scholar on Hannah Moore and a, a scholar in general. Um, she writes like a historian, though, so that I'm not, then that's like, that's like good and bad. Um, <laughs> very, I mean, very, she's a wonderful scholar. Um, and her, hers is the book, uh, her tight, that's where the first Victorian comes from. She named her the first Victorian. Uh, and then there are a lot, and, and the funny thing is, there are, many, many biographies that were written of Moore from the time of her death all the way through um, the early 20th century. I mean, they would come and go, but there are a number of them. Um, and she really fell out of, she really fell out of favor in the, in the late Victorian age, as many things did um, when, the, when the children of the Victorians grew up and rejected their parents. Anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> but thank Professor you. Plato? Uh, yeah, you mentioned, of course, earlier, one of the key aspects of 
evangelical faith coming out was the interiority of mm -hmm. it, the internal person. Mm -hmm. And of course, the age of the novel, um, mm -hmm. the age with Richardson and Austin, who you just mm -hmm. also mentioned. Um, there you're having the focus in that literature on the interiority of the individual. And it's interesting, she did, was a novelist and an evangelical. Reading her novels, do you see, you've mentioned that their didactic quality. Is mm -hmm. there any hint of that crossover? She's in those, both of those worlds. Does that actually appear in her literature or is that one of the weaknesses? Yeah, that, that is a great question. I, I mean, I'm sure if I wanted to make a case for it, I could find it, but I would say that that is, that her that her novel really is not a novel, you know. It's it's just basically a um, a a thinly va you know a, a a treatise on education and religion that has a thin narrative veneer. Um, I mean, it's more interesting than that, but it really is not novelistic in that sense. Um, and that's why I do I do think that the scholars who think her tracks are her highest literary achievement are right because there's a colorfulness in the language and and she and a, a sense of voice um, that rivals George Saunders maybe uh, there maybe I'll write about that uh, now that you've asked um, so uh, it's it's an interesting question I want to think about more but I would I, my fast answer is that, that it's missing and that's that's why she's unreadable today dr. Watson thank you um, Hannah Moore was flourishing during the time of our founders, and I was wondering if she ever made any comments about what she thought of the newly founded United States, maybe even our own slave problem here. Yeah, that, um, there, there is mention of it, um, and I, but I, you know, I, I wrote so little about that. There, I don't think that there is much. Um, she was very deeply concerned with the French Revolution. So she, she was writing. I mean, the American Revolution was kind of done and gone. She did the. She had an altercation with an American general who was um, actually that is that she. No, I shouldn't say altercation. Um, uh, general Tarleton is that a familiar name? I don't. I'm not a historian either. But he he was this like brutal uh, American general from the from the American. Uh, Revolutionary War, um, who had a reputation for being just mean and scary, and he came. She was at a dinner party with him, and she wanted to show him the pamphlet, and she didn't. She was afraid to. So that that's that's the the first thing that comes to my mind about. Um, but again, this was much later. So her she was consumed as many of her um, countrymen were with the French Revolution um, and the American Revolution. Just was not as much on her radar that I recall, so. We'll take one last question. You got one, Peter? Um, you spoke briefly about her work in boycotting the West India Company uh, sugar mm -hmm. trade. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on why and what the effect of that was. Um, there isn't a lot on the record about that, but, the, but it, I mean, she did call it blood sugar. Um, it was because it was it was made you know it was and traded on through the blood of of slaves, um, so abolitionists did do boycotts. They weren't they they weren't that pervasive, um, and hers I don't think was was a huge one. But the fact that it's considered to be the most successful one just tells you how uphill this battle was for those who were trying. I mean, I, I, di I didn't read it, but there was, uh, I, have, I have it here. She, she's a tr she is believed to have written a very a letter to the editor in Bristol um, in response to, uh, in, to the critics of the, of the, of the, of the boycott. Um, because as I said, they, I mean, they, they were looked at, people who boycotted the sugar were just looked down upon as like do-gooders and, and, um, and, uh, and promoting asceticism. I mean, they were just mocked and ridiculed. And, um, and so she is believed to have written a letter to the editor um, responding to those kinds of critics. And, but there is just isn't a vast record of that. Great, well, let's thank Dr. Pryor again.
So I'll, we'll just conclude, I'll, I'll conclude with an encouragement. Uh, get fierce convictions, buy the book, um, buy it you know, for yourself and for your own edification, buy it for your pastor, buy it for friends and parents, because it's an awesome book. It's, it's very accessible, very readable, and, and you'll get much of this sort of encouragement. I'm just going to close this out uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're the God of history, and we thank you, Lord, that you raise up men and women um, that are testimonies to you and to your grace, uh, both those who are well-known and famous in church history, those who are more obscure, and those whom we never hear of at all. Uh, Lord, thank you that you work in each of our lives, and as we see the way you called Hannah Moore and uh, brought her up from her own lower station uh, to, to standing in society in order to use her uh, for your purposes. Lord, I pray that you would give us a, a great sense of encouragement, that you do the same for each of us, and uh, Lord, that you would use us well in the spheres of influence that we have. Thank you for Dr. Pryor and for her work and being able to bring Hannah Moore's story to us. I pray your blessing on her and her time here at CCU. Be with each of us as we leave this place with bad weather. I pray that you would keep us safe and uh, bring us back here tomorrow safely. For Christ's sake, amen.